welcome to this lunchtime talk um, from the Center for Ethics, Society, and Computing, um, pronounced ESCAPE, if you didn't notice our catchy acronym. Um, uh, well, I am uh, very pleased to introduce Caroline Sinders, who's an award-winning um, designer and researcher and artist, and she has like, a really wonderful hybrid practice. Um, I mean, the, like the amount of um, honor she has is like too numerous to mention, but she's worked with the United Nations, Amnesty International, IBM Watson, Wikimedia Foundation. She's had fellowships at Harvard Kennedy School, um, uh, Google's People and Artificial Intelligence Research Group, um, Ars Electronica's AI Lab, um, and Mozilla Foundation and IBEAM. Um, and, you know, her work has been shown at the Victoria and Albert Museum, MoMA PS1, um, in Wired and, you know, many other um, places. Uh, she did her master's at NYU ITP. Um, and uh, one thing I really want to mention is that um, she is the Roman Witt visiting artist for the entire semester at the Stamp School. So she's got a studio on North Campus and um, she's very interested in, you know, meeting researchers in the field she works in, um, artists, um, scholars, um, and designers. And so if you're you know, you want to talk to her, please reach out to her while she's here. Um, so please join me in giving a warm welcome to Caroline Sinders. Hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, can you hear me? Is this a good volume? Okay, great. Um, yeah, my email is at the very end of the presentation. So please email me. Um, I would love to chat or interact or, or work with y'all. I'm going to be holding like a few small workshops across the um, like February and like part of March in my studio, uh, even though it's sort of loud with the AC in there, or I guess the filtering system, but it's it's very industrial sounding and it's also very big, which is nice. So, um, and uh, when I when I am there, I wanna host workshops. Um, but anyway, it's nice to meet all of you. I'm excited to talk about the sort of hybrid practice I have um, and how I think about my art. Um, which is sort of centered around ideas of usefulness. Um, so hi, I'm Caroline. Um, I study people on the internet. I'm an artist and researcher and I work usually primarily in civil society. Um, sometimes I work with or critique the private sector and I look at the impacts of technology and society and often its effects on uh, marginalized groups. Um, so if you have read some of the residencies I have, um, one of the things I always like to highlight, especially in talks like this is my background is in photojournalism and research and design and art. So I see everything through the lens of legibility and research storytelling. So these are skills I honed as a photojournalist. And with these skills, I make art and I do human rights research, focusing through the lens of how design and technology affects people in their everyday lives. And this is kind of my current workflow in a way. Um, it's how I approach problem solving across everything I do. I wanna make research and that includes data and that can be um, qualitative or quantitative research, that can be desk research, that can be design-based research because I find it to be practical. It can create something that wasn't there before. It can test a hypothesis to see if it works or doesn't work. Sometimes research is a necessary tool to help legitimize the kind of invisibilities that institutions refuse to recognize. So sometimes there's something incredibly helpful in, in sort of starting with a foundation of research. Um, but I think it's really important to sort of take research into the next step, which is activism, because it builds off that practical research. Activism is helpful. It helps push society forward. Activism can suggest um, new, like changes and new ways of like the way, uh, new ways of functioning in a way that sometimes research cannot. Oftentimes in like an academic research lab setting, we'd have to test the suggestions we'd wanna see. But when we look at this through a lens of activism and advocacy, I think we can still suggest those changes and work with communities and center community knowledge to implement and suggest why those changes are useful without having to run necessarily experiments about the changes. Um, so it's always important for me in my practice to know that the next step of the research is that it's building towards something that the research isn't stopping, it's moving towards something else. But then the next step is where I take activism and research and I distill it into something else, art which is a poetry that's necessary to help the world function. I think art can help take, can help create a current imaginaries from like current urgencies. It can help visualize or sort of uh, hypothesize or sort of envision what that change can look like. And again, the art I'm talking about is deeply rooted in research and in activism. Or another way to think of my uh, 
my practice is, and sorry, I like changed the the slide width and it like messed up all of my gifts um, and I didn't catch this one. Um, but another way to think of this is perhaps like a research driven arts practice. So this is art again that's shaped and uh, driven by research, but it doesn't have to be data visualization. So that's what people think of when they hear like a research based practice, but it could have data visualization within it. The way I think about it is what if you made net art or technology based art but with the same principles as photojournalism. So like photojournalism, research driven art uses specific structures and a sense of purpose to constrain it. These constraints work much like how a skeleton works. While they stabilize the practice just as a rib cage stabilizes the body, they do not define the entire practice nor keep it from moving and flexing on its own. So in this way, the research I do stabilizes and shapes my art practice, but does not dictate the outcome. Sometimes in art making, this is not uh, true of every artist, but sometimes there's an idea of what the outcome is going to be that like, Whatever is manifesting out of your project will be a painting or a sculpture. In my practice, I let the research drive what the outcomes should be. So I often don't know what the outcome of a practice or a particular project will be. The research and the findings will sort of lead me to what the outcome is. And I've been thinking about this a lot in terms of usefulness. Um, I'm sure as I'm, I'm well, as I say, I'm sure you can tell. I'm actually not sure if you can tell. Um, I'm an American, but I've lived abroad for the past few years. So um, when I'm in other contexts, like in the UK where I live, it's very clear I'm not British because I do not sound like a British person. Um, but I'm, I'm an American. And um, I, I was in Berlin in uh, May 2020 when I was watching the US sort of erupting in protest for Black Lives Matter after George Floyd's death. And I saw a number of curators and critics uh, on social networks who remark about the role of tech artists and like their necessary role in unpacking technology and justice and activism. But a lot of these tech artists, these curators were mentioning were white and male, which I found both uh, annoying and troubling. So I reached out to a good friend of mine, Nora Khan, who's a curator and writer. And over email, we started discussing artistic practices during moments of cultural upheaval. Nora wrote to me, quote, how might critical technological work be called on in this moment to do more? Coded design work of that capacity. Hybrid research practices can explain and expose the logics of racial capitalism, but under the auspices of artic artistic collaboration can enact critique and make an argument through process and through a built system, end quote. And I've been thinking a lot about that also related to this idea of usefulness. How can art sort of be a part of a useful movement? This idea of usefulness in interdisciplinary work is a key and necessary part of a research-driven art practice. And it's directly extremely inspired by Tanya Bergera's Arte Util, which translates to utilitarian art. Arte Util draws on artistic thinking to imagine and create and implement tactics that can change how we act in society, again, heavily focused on usefulness, on tool building and on communities. In her email to me, Nora highlighted the strengths of work stre stretching across many domains and her work and her words, making art a necessary Trojan horse to discuss useful change. So sometimes art can be the thing in a white cube space, sort of bring in all different kinds of conversations. For me personally, this is where I turn to the work of American artists whose work we see here in my blue window. Along with Francis Singh, Joanna Mole, Adam Harvey, Mimi Anoha, forensic architecture and others. These artists are pulling from research or investigatory based practices and with work that manifests into writing outputs, artifacts, writings, and educations. What I like about this is it sort of expands our ideas to what art can be. A workshop can be an artistic practice and an artistic artifact. So can a piece of writing. And I like this idea in terms of thinking what is an artistic practice when we're engaging with things like human rights and usefulness. Other examples of a social justice research and artistic based practices are works like The Hidden Life of an Amazon User by Joanna Mole or Adam Harvey's V-Frame research we see here, which came out of his numerous collaborations with the human rights archiving group Mnemonic, formerly known as the Syrian Archive. Some of his work has also been used in the investigative work of forensic architecture. One other example of a research and social justice based art practice is Mimi Anoha's. Anoha's research uh, work on the politics and injustices of data sets have resulted in artworks like the Library of Missing Data Sets and the widely cited Canonical Zine, The People's Guide to AI, co-written with Diana J. Nusera. These pieces and artists occupy a liminal space of research journalism and art. 
And for me, I see those all combined. But shifting gears, I wanna talk a little bit about design because I think design is a necessary part of an artistic practice. And again, I wanna sort of pause for a second and say, it's really funny sometimes when I give this talk um, outside of the United States, because in the United Kingdom, design is considered very much a form of an artistic practice. Sometimes when I give this talk um, in specific art contexts, uh, sometimes people are like, what do you mean? Design's different. Design is useful. It's commercial. It's productized. But I think design is a very necessary um, medium to critique and look at and sort of think of it at, in an expanded role. So why design? Because everything around us is designed from how we entered this physical building to how people entered Zoom online to why we can or cannot block people on Slack. We can't to how information is presented or not presented to us on Twitter and generally how the world both physically and digitally surrounds us. This slide is a cheeky nod to Don Norman and the design of everyday objects, but effectively in the design world been sort of grappling with this false notion that design is universal and seamless and intuitive, and it's not. In some cases like these doors, design makes objects appear, they function one way when they do not. And I think this really matters when we're trying to look at all the complexities of technology. What's design? What's design's role or impact when we look at things like algorithm, AI, or recommendation systems? I believe that design is this equalizing action that can distill code and policy into understandable interfaces because design can elevate and obfuscate. Design is not just a skill, but a practice and a language in and of itself. So to start trying to tackle problems around complex issues while creating spaces for human connection, design also needs to be at the forefront of a conversation, particularly around the issues relating to technology and human rights because design is a part of technology. So the design can be the thing that explains, we reference the slide again, what the code and policy are outlining. So for issues like labor, harassment, security, and privacy, design is incredibly important. How does design translate into policy? Online harassment reporting is a great example. Ideally, users don't have to deeply understand a social network's policy on harassment in order to report it. Design takes the technical infrastructure, the ability to select a piece of content, click on it, and then click on what kind of harassment it is, as you see here, as well as the political infrastructure, the kind of harassment or harm the content falls into, describing the platform policy in a way that is short and hopefully understandable, and folds all of that into the product design process, the harassment reporting system. Security settings are another example. For users to report content, they shouldn't have to be a lawyer, and to adjust security settings, they shouldn't have to be an engineer. So design helps make complexities understandable and more legible. So design does affect things like policy. For example, we can look at this in areas like deceptive design patterns, more commonly known as dark patterns. Deceptive design patterns are design patterns that unintentionally or int intentionally trick, manipulate, or confuse users into making decisions they normally wouldn't make. Um, they have been well known in the design world for over a decade, but have only been recently focused on in general press publications with a ProPublica expose in 2017 or 18. This is actually a, a project I'm working on with the UK's data protection and privacy regulators, specifically on deceptive design patterns and their impacts on data protection and privacy. Um, some policy readers have pointed out that the recent popularity or focus on deceptive de design patterns is because we can start seeing more and more now their serious and widespread damage. For example, when filing taxes, like as ProPublica uh, found, or uh, in the case of myself, uh, when the European Union's General Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, was implemented, this is something we saw pop up. So let's look at this landing page. Let's look at the next one. What do we think is happening here? So if we look at it, we'll see that the accept all cookies are almost nudged to accept it. It's a black button. It pops out. It looks like a button. It's the thing that pops out the most. Cookie settings is a hyperlink, right? Um, what do we think is underneath cookie settings? This is where the true consensual choice is. In a lot of cases, we could argue that this actually isn't fulfilling GDPR. Um, given GDPR's principles of consent and transparency. What makes it a dark pattern is your actual real choice, your consensual choice is hidden under this step. So in this way, we can see perhaps very clearly how design directly impacts policy currently. So then why design? 
Can a door be political? Yes. Can a pop-up be political? Definitely, yes. Um, but can it be art? And this is where I think, well, perhaps. What does art do? It transports us. It's poetic. It analogizes. It creates artifacts of visual interpretation. Some would say it's not necessarily direct or didactic, but I think that it can be. Ideally, we think that it's different from design because it aims to achieve different things. So how can design be art? Um, the way I was taught design um, at NYU was thinking of design as useful and profitable. So that meant objects, things purchased, things quite commercial, but design is so much more than that. And this is where I turn to critical design in terms of trying to explore speculative, poetic, and ways that design can critique and still be art. So critical design is a methodology, one of many, that's trying to address the limitations of product design. Critical design as a term was coined in 1997 by Anthony Doon, and it comes from a practice he developed with Fiona Rabi when they were research fellows at the Royal College of Art. So critical design is one that's trying to demand that design stop existing in terms of capitalist production, which is a function of product design, and said push product design towards self-examination and cultural critique. Um, by reflecting how product design can be created, critical design also creates new ways for an audience to engage with design and understand all facets of design in their everyday lives. So ideally, it's trying to take um, the current norms of product design, sort of imagining what can be created from that uh, from, from that space when you remove the idea that it has to be commercial. So the way I like to think about it is how would we rebuild chairs or mattresses knowing that the endpoint perhaps isn't to make a universal scalable extractive product, but something else. Does that change the way in which we would make something or engage with something? Does that change the materials we would use um, or um, how, how we would implement it or not in our daily lives? So then it's in this context, design and art are the same for me. Because with these aforementioned works of Dune and Rabi, Mimi Anoha, Adam Harvey, forensic architecture and others, we could look at them solely as art or solely as research, but they're much more richly seen when viewed together as a research-based artistic activist practices. So in this context, design and art are the same for me. While it's a wordy description, it rings true. The works there aren't just to bear witness though that alone would be worthwhile. They question, provocate, and offer a solution to a problem. They should not be viewed as a form of techno-solutionism, however, because the solutions the artists are providing are not meant to create an end-all be-all to other potential solutions, but rather they serve to offer temporary open source fixes for gaps in inequity and violence created by society and thus become poetic witnesses of those gaps. This is a kind of band-aid in a similar space where I pursue my own practice. Band-aids are necessary provocations or patches or can exist as necessary provocations or patches while participatory design and deconstruction with artists and researchers and technologists and communities can overhaul systems or destroy systems together. The togetherness and collaboration is key though, but nonetheless provocations within art and design create new imaginaries for new realities. Shifting gears, one of the things I'm also really interested in is thinking about um, complexity and legibility and how so much of legibility is really tied to literacy and tied to equi equity. Um, and so in preparing for this talk, I decided to also show perhaps some more of the research to perhaps give a basis of understanding of how I then think about technology more. So this is not an art project. Um, this is something I made with Mikkel Luria and uh, Shessa Garbutt for the Center for Democracy and Technology, pulling out of research that the CDT, Center for Democracy and Technology, was working on in terms of trying to make recommendation algorithms more legible. Um, so they were co-designing with communities and I was brought in to also help think through what were these different like wishes and wish lists that communities wanted. So the goal with these prototypes were based on user research that Mikkel did with the CDT. Um, and the goal, was also trying to imagine what could an interactive transparency report look like. These actually could just be like settings. Um, we looked at research that other social media recommend based on other social media recommendation experiences. And part of this was designed trying to think um, what we know, like how people are spending their time and how do we give an analytical overview. The reason this first page is really granular is we're hoping, or rather the idea is to guide people through the things they've already done almost like um, like a dashboard of what you've done that month, because it really grounds them in the data. 
And then um, it helps also sort of prepare and inform um, because they'll be seeing the same information again and again. For a person may not remember that they've posted 600 comments, but they may remember in this time period that they were posting a lot. They'll probably remember the 10, the 10 accounts they started following or the three different countries they visited or maybe the new followers they gave. So part of this is also trying to give a snapshot at how much data social media networks are actually gathering. This is designed by the way, to, uh, based on like no particular specific social media network, um, just to sort of throw that out there. Um, but I thought a lot about Facebook and Twitter and Instagram when I was making this, if that's helpful. Um, anyway, going forward. So this leads us to prototype two, which is the inferences about their experience. Inferences are like assumptions that the recommendation algorithm is making from all the different kinds of hard and soft data you're giving. Hard data can be the things like, like the posts, the actual posts you're writing or who you're talking to. The soft data inferences is perhaps, um, maybe it's like sentiment analysis on those posts, or maybe it's inferring, let's say uh, what your political affiliation is based on different pages you followed and different news, uh, news article links you've posted. Um, so one thing we wanted to show was like the data that was related to the hard data. But let's say you click on some, which is like a location. But let's say you click on something else like political affiliation. This is where I think having a more granular break, uh, breakdown and again, mimicking that design interface we started with really grounds the user. We've already been teaching them uh, through like the first page what the interface does. So by looking at this one, again, they, they may remember that they've joined a group, but they probably won't remember all the content they've clicked on or all the comments they've left, but they may remember some of the URLs they've read. So again, we're trying to grant, ground them in a sense of the scale of the data. So ideally they would hover on these different things and you'd be able to click to go to another page to see even a more granular breakdown. So all of the information can be explored this way. So a lot of this is trying to think about how do we give data in context and also explain through data visualization what inferences are and how, how they potentially work. Um, this is also true of this, this, uh, this interface, which is the plug and play. And so part of the design inspiration behind this, and, and actually all of these came from my time at IBM Watson, where we had to make a lot of playable demos, a lot of plug and play demos to actually explain how the different um, APIs we had and the different technical systems we had, how they actually work. Sometimes just giving people a blank interface is, is too much. It's, it's too, um, it's almost like having like a performance anxiety. Like, what do I type? Well, how does this work? So by being able to sort of show people or pre-seed data, you're helping them figure out how to play with the system and in a way potentially test it or see what works well and what doesn't. Um, so part of this is to show, so on this page, it's sort of showing why you're seeing certain content based on your information. On the next page is then you change part of your information. You see what new ads or new kinds of inferences could pop up. So it lets people sort of play with like visually and see how an algorithm could potentially function. Um, so in the previous page, we saw that someone lived in New York and they were seeing things like like the Bronx Zoo, and they can see perhaps how that's directly related. Um, so in this case, in this uh, change, they've changed the location and they can see how that directly impacts what it is they're seeing. Um, so they're seeing all different kinds of ads for museums and they can change every, every aspect of this. And this is just sort of like a fast and interactive and lightweight way to think about how do you help show and sort of through interaction teach potentially how aspects of, an, of the recommendation algorithm works. And this last one is one of the most important ones and also one of the most speculative in my mind, because if we were designing this really for uh, production, we'd probably design the interface actually quite differently, because um, I'm not sure how intuitive this is, but I think it works as a provocative data visualization. But this is also one of the most important ones. And so in this research with the CDT, we made this also knowing that the research can form as a space of advocacy, that this is the kinds of interactions and the kinds of agency that people should have in regards to how platforms are using their data and being able to understand directly how that data is used. Um, and so this is the one where people can see what different kinds of groups can interact with their data. And then they have the ability to move their like those different kinds of data. So on one, on one 
side, like the lighter blue we see publicly available, that's your name and your country location, you could move that all the way to, to the side where it's black, where it's private data, data that's never shared. You could move all the data points over to there, ideally. But let's say you were like, you know, I'm fine with like trusted partners, like researchers having access to my data for research. You could then move um, everything into like that related column, right? And so the idea is being able to show the user much more specifically. Here, here is who has access to your data. And it's also broken down again by like those different types we saw earlier, right? So like amount of content or your interactions on the platform or your ad interaction history and things like that. Um, so um, one of the things that I just think is really important is this kind of, again, granular, granular agency that's really needed in terms of thinking about well, what do we want transparency to look like and how do we want that to actually function inside of technology? Um, and I think that that's incredibly important. When I think of like the activist work that I do, transparency and agency for me are combined. Transparency isn't just a disclosure um, because a company, and they, they do often, they'll tell us what they're going to do, but we have no impact right on those decisions. So I think for transparency to be in action, there has to be a role of agency which means that we need interfaces or products that allow for all different kinds of digital literacy. So something like this, being able to say, like not just see how people are accessing your data, but then actually say like, no, this is how I want my data interacted with, or I don't want it interacted with at all. So these are some of the things that I grapple with in my, let's say more human rights research that very much bleeds into my artistic practice. So when we look at some of my later projects, I want you to just sort of think about this one for a second that like some of these thought processes are always underneath they're always foundational to the other work that i'm doing here's a project i worked on with um this really amazing group called hyphen labs and we were selected as a lead artist for the tate exchange in the tate modern in 2019 so we put on like a very small two-week biennale um, where we invited in different artists to curate their work um, we had workshops with different technology experts, um, and we were looking at the state of power and privacy online from looking at widespread surveillance to how AI is shaping human culture and relationships and the emerging threats that technology can pose to human rights. Artists and speakers hailed from Amnesty International, Change.org, the BBC, the Mozilla Foundation, um, Somerset House Studios, and many others. One of the reasons I was so excited to work with Hyphen Labs was the ability to bring in policy researchers and political activists and watchdog groups um, throughout London and then also the UK was to bring them directly into the collaboration. It's important, I think, when creating activist and social justice work as artists that we avoid replicating unintentionally work done by activists in the field. Instead, we can work directly with those activists. So in fighting data surveillance, the way to create change is to work together and create many different levers of pressure in the public. And arts institutions are a necessary part of that lever. So we need to avoid creating alone in the space of art, and we should seek collaboration with other activists and researchers who are working on similar or identical causes. The two weeks of programming unfolded in this unique space designed to mimic the many different layers of privacy we toggle between online, as well as a floor schematic highlighting the privacy concerns in our everyday lives. So when people arrived at the Tate, for example, on our floor, they were asked how they got there and the schematic sort of sends them on this flow chart. And what ends up sort of showing or revealing is that there's no way to really avoid surveillance when entering the Tate, given the amount of CCTV cameras around the city of London and surrounding the Tate Modern, for example, but also just taking the tube or a bus. Um, your credit cards or your tube pass are still in a way being tracked in data mined. We then also built these uh, sort of specific structural spaces that were metaphors for our, our everyday lives. And these, uh, these um, fabric sculptures are actually like the inspiration of my Roman Wit project. The metaphors we used are the town hall, an analog of Twitter being the most public, the park bench, which you see here, an analog of Facebook being semi-public. So even though parks are open to actually sort of uh, go into them, you have to physically go into them, similar to Facebook. The living room and analog of WhatsApp, which is semi-intimate, and then uh, and then the bedroom, which is private or intimate text conversations. Again, we also had arts installations that spotlight the perils 
of modern technology like facial recognition, website tracking, and harmful content recommendations. The following Im uh, images display a participant voting on a feature to ban. So this is where we had emotion recognition, facial recognition, website tracking, um, and like a few others, along with tear off truisms describing surveillance capitalism. The goal of the project was to bring, again, conversations with pol uh, privacy and policymakers into the white cube space to transform these conversations and make them more actionable and tangible for museum goers. How often does the lead of an advocacy campaign get to face-to-face -to -face engage with the people that sign their campaigns? Not really frequently. And vice versa, how often does someone who signs a campaign actually get to talk to and meet the people that are behind the campaign and understand more about how they planned it or how it works? Again, not very frequently. So switching gears, I'm going to talk about one last project, um, and then we will be able to eat and chat more, um, which is called Feminist Dataset, um, which is a, a critical design project of mine, which started in 2017, actually when I was a design researcher at IBM Watson, as a response to the many documented cases um, of problems in technology and bias in machine learning. Um, this project is inspired by the work of the maker movement. Uh, critical Design, Arte Util, the Critical Eng Engineering Manifesto, and uh, APC's Feminist Principles of the Internet. APC, by the way, is not a clothing brand. I'm referring to the NGO. Feminist Dataset is a multi-year project which uses Professor Kimberly Crenshaw's uh, definition and work around intersectional feminism as an investigatory framework for analyzing every step of the machine learning pipeline from start to finish. It's trans-inclusive and focusing on racial justice. It's extremely process driven. So the outputs or artifacts are workshops on data and machine learning. The workshops here are key as they are a mechanism to think through, well, what does feminist data look like? So how do we make, let's say community driven or equitable data collection? What does that look like at practice? What does it look like at scale? And I think of that as slow data. Um, it's farm to server table style data, if you will. But the work, uh, the data itself is text and it's text that sort of imbues intersectionality, but it's not text about intersectional feminism. Which I'll explain, what does that mean? Um, so it's, it's looking at writing and seeing if there's intersectionality within it. Let's look at an article about income inequality. An intersectional feminist article would highlight that white women, black women, indigenous women, Latino women, and trans folks of all different races are paid all different amounts. So an article that simply represents women as a monolith is not intersectional, cannot be in the data set. And this is also what makes the data process a slow gathering process. It's not about quantity, it's about quality. So often it means really having to read and consider and weigh, is this text, like does it fit the data set or not? So again, it really slows down the process. And this comes out of, um, of uh, my own personal views of data, where I often am pushing for, can we think of data as, per, as precious materials and not just sort of an ever expanding sort of ubiquitous um, available resource? How would we treat data sets or data in particular if we viewed every data, every piece of data almost like a bar of gold or like the last recorded conversation you could ever have with a grandparent? We'd probably treat all different pieces of data much more securely and much more preciously. And I think that that's really important. How can we sort of rethink the ways in which we engage with data? Related to that, how can we also think about data as organic matter? That data sets should have endpoints, that perhaps they expire. How would that change the way we engage with data? I think about this a lot when we think about sort of the current underpinnings of machine learning. How many times has a product or project used the Enron email data set? That's a really, really old and particular data set. I think it's important to also think about when we say data expiring, not that the data set disappears, perhaps we can see it for archival reasons, but you can't use it anymore in a technology process or in a research process. How would that change the way we create with things like machine learning? We start to reshift and change what we think a data set is and how much access we have to one. These are all the different things we talk about in Feminist Data Set. Within the workshops, community members then research and submit any written data. We have no citation requirements. It could be poems, text messages, blogs, transcripts of conversations, whatever. 
The only time my hand as the creator appears is to remove non-intersectional data, and I'm extremely firm about this. Racists and TERFs need not apply. Pedagogically, feminist data set is deeply inspired by Thomas Twaite's toaster project, in which you see here, in which Twaite builds a commercial toaster from scratch, from digging up iron ore out of his garden to having to build circuits with that to figure out how do you make a uh, plastic at home. This, um, this toaster technically works. I don't think you should like cook with it, but it does technically work. Inspired by that, feminist data set takes this critical view on software and machine learning. What does it mean to thoughtfully make with every, uh, like what does it mean to thoughtfully make and craft about the process of machine learning to carefully consider, consider every angle of making, iterating, and designing. Every step has to be rethought through a feminist lens and like Twait's toaster, it does need to technically work. One of the things I think that's important about feminist data set is that this won't be commercial software. We can't hand make the systems of Google. There is going to be friction and perhaps failure, but that's what I'm interested in with feminist data set. So we can think of this as like a visual aid of how broken my software will be. It will technically work, but it's going to perhaps look like, if you will, Twait's toaster. And similar to Twait's toaster, I think it's important to have these deeper discussions around extraction and what does it mean to make something like a really common element. Um, Twait was inspired by like how easy it is to find a toaster and was really curious of how do you sort of remake or relook at this common object, which is what makes it a critical design project. You can't build a toaster from scratch. It's very difficult because the methods of extraction are so large. You need an entire system. And I feel like at times that's very similar with, with technology. Um, one of the things I also like to point out about feminist data set is I'm interested in friction and in failure. So I, I'm using a MacBook Pro to work on this project. Is that a form of feminist technology? Not really, probably, definitely not. But should I, can I make my own laptop? That's something potentially that could be done in the project, right? So part of this is also sort of recognizing when trade-offs have to happen. Um, and that's also what I'm interested in. How do you take a framework? How do you sort of outline it in a way that is sort of pulling from equity and intersectionality? And what happens when you actually implement that in making? That's what I'm interested in. That's like the particular friction I'm interested in looking at. And that's really what this project is exploring. Here's an image from when we installed feminist data set at the Victoria and Albert Museum. So the next iteration of feminist data set is TRK or technically responsible knowledge, which is an open source project that's looking at wage um, inequality and is creating an open source alternative to data labeling and training in AI. So now we're looking at what do we do once we have a data set, how do we sort of clean it and bring it together? And how would we also start to perhaps generate and train a model? Um, TRK was funded by the Mozilla Foundation and was created with KDM, Ian Arnaud Fuma, and Rainbow Unicorn. In 2019, I interviewed research labs and artists and startups who use Mechanical Turk style services and microservice workers across Crowdflower, Fiverr, and Mechanical Turk. I even became a Mechanical Turker myself for a few months. Oh, sorry, that should have been going. Um, so I'll, I'll mention this as well. One of the things that I noticed um, when I was looking at and analyzing Mechanical Turk is even if research labs and startups are trying to price equitably, the interface of Mechanical Turk works against it because there's no consideration taken for time. So if I asked any of you to help me with a project and I said, oh, I can pay you 20 pounds, that may be a really great deal if it takes five minutes, but that's a really bad deal if it takes, let's say, two days, right? So time is very integral to the process of trying to understand if something is equitable or not in these sort of piecemeal systems that treats labor as individual tasks, right? And so one of, that's one of the things I was really interested in, in the ways in which people understand and like fundamentally misunderstand what labor costs and how long it takes to do things. which I think I've pretty much already summarized this page then. Yay me. So moving on to the next one. Um, if the machine learning pipeline is death by a thousand cuts, I think of TRK as one very small band-aid for one very small cut, similar to spend this data set. 
The project doesn't propose a solution for all issues related to machine learning or even a major one for Amazon's Mechanical Turk. Because so many issues related to machine learning are issues of a deeper, more ingrained societal inequity, which can really only be addressed through large shifts in restructuring in society and legislation. So no art project and no technology project can do that alone, nor should, nor should they say that they do that. But as a, as a designer and researcher and artist, I try to look at what kinds of research work can alleviate or expose issues. TRK focuses on how through pricing structures, platform incentives, and the invisible nature of gig work, clients underprice, undervalue, and fundamentally misunderstand how tasks are handled in these human as a service platform. Part of design thinking around TRK is to examine equity and transparency within interfaces and uh, tool design and see what kinds of problems UX and UI create in technology. That's one of the reasons I also created this is I'm gonna have to be using a system at some point to clean or or uh, to clean a data set or train a model, I can't necessarily use something like Mechanical Turk. So one of the things I was also grappling with was even with this information of what I'm doing, how does like the process itself of a data set or of a model, what are already the issues within it? Inspired by the data sheets for data sets white paper, TRK injects plain text information into the data set with information, including a description of what the data set is, who made it, when it was made and why it was made. So what's the intention of the data set, right? There are times when we can imagine that a data set could technically be biased. If I were doing a data set of a portrait of myself every day, that would be a very Caroline centric data set, right? And that would probably not be good for anyone to use in like a facial recognition model, right? So I do think sometimes it's, I think it's really important to understand like why was this data set made? What context was it made for? Who made it and where it was made? User experience design is a utilitarian intelligence focusing on architectural layouts, usability, and user flows, but design has a politics to it. It can suppress or uplift content. So design, much like technology, isn't neutral. And as an artist, I use design as a material to confront and comment on the slickness and inequity of for-profit technologies. I think of... I think of technology and design um, as my way to sort of confront like the world that I'm living in. Sometimes the tools I use don't quite work well. So how can I make them better? An interface is useful and expressive. And I think it's important to look at the role technology plays in our everyday lives and create all different kinds of interventions within that. That can be things that are extremely useful, perhaps do not feel like traditional art but that can still be a part of an artistic process. So this is where I reflect back again on critical design, the methodology of removing capitalism from the structure of design. Design can be a tool much like technology and much like art to create political small acts of resistance and change. What kinds of design can we make when we stop viewing it through a Western Silicon Valley and neoliberal and capitalist lens? We've seen code and art made without the constraints of capitalism. And I think it's time for design to do that as well. Critical design, social justice, and design justice are needed now more than ever for tool making and for design to confront how it's perpetuated right, white supremacy and change its relationships to power. Design can be an actuator for change, but design alone is not an entire solution towards injustice in society and technology. Design can confront a problem while acknowledging it is part of the problem. Design can help visualize or highlight parts of systemic injustice, but design must unpack and confront its role in contributing to injustice in technology, especially technology in Silicon Valley. I use design as an artistic practice and as a, lead, and as a lever to create usefulness to explore problem solving. So I think design can sit in a space to solve small problems that are part of bigger issues and bigger spaces. So my approach to design thinking is proposing a decommodification of art and design and situating both of them in a process and an investigation. Artistic approaches to problems allow for collaborations that might not ever happen in other fields. Reflecting on Nora's point earlier, making art this necessary Trojan horse for useful change. So it's in this way, art's role in social justice and human rights projects can make space for new kinds of work in a way that other fields traditionally could not let those projects exist. Then what does change look like? I think it has to be interdisciplinary across many fields of art, activism, policy, and social justice working together and not separately. Thank you so much for your time. 
Um, if you'd like to hear more about my Roman Whip project, which is looking at privacy and intimacy in technology, and potentially, potentially building sculptures related to that, um, I would love to chat with you. Um, I'll be holding some workshops. Some will be kind of speculative design based. So if you're interested in learning what that is or how to use that in your practice, I would love to talk to you. So you can email me here because I'm still figuring out my Michigan email. I have to call someone to set it up, um, which I need to do. Thank you so much, Caroline. That was wonderful. So uh, just a reminder, Caroline's going to be here all semester. And so you should reach out to her if you're interested to talk to her more. Um, I think we have time for a few questions. Um, and there might be, are you looking at questions on the on the Zoom? Or um, maybe just, does can we see those? There's no questions. Um, you could see if anybody has any questions on Zoom, but let me see if anybody here has uh, a question and you need to talk into the mic um, for the people on the Zoom. I have a two part question and I ask it as a producer of data. Um, so one, <clears throat> is it really the case that uh, it's data first, it's, it's data first, uh, it's activism second and art third? I kind of think uh, that it's the art that is going to increase and motivate and stimulate the activism. Uh, and maybe the two go together and it's emphasizing a point that really is, is, is not very critical, uh, but that I think um, art, as you've been talking about it, uh, really comes before or comes with the activism. It's not a product of the activism. Uh, second, um, maybe you could say a bit more about uh, the relationship between uh, these various stages. Um, it seems that at least to some extent, uh, it's the same unit or team or person that uh, co uh, collects the data, uh, does, the act, does the art, and engages in activism. And I think uh, when that occurs, that would probably be terrific. But it strikes me that maybe that isn't what occurs much of the time. Uh, and uh, that, uh, I mean, in my case, or the case of the group that I'm part of, uh, we collect a lot of data. We think it's fair. We hope it's useful. We think it's probably as useful. Uh, we'd like to see it uh, rendered in some sort of an art form uh, and that that would increase whatever the likelihood is that uh, data would be used in ways to affect societal change. Uh, but that there are different people. It's not really the same group. And, and so the, maybe if I end with a kind of summary question, uh, what is the advice to those who uh, create data and might welcome art and activism, but aren't themselves really uh, in a position to be part of it. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I really appreciate it. One thing I will say is, um, so like the steps, that's more of my own methodology. Um, and perhaps I'll explain maybe the reason behind that. Um, I think it's really important that while we think of art, sometimes I'll argue that art is a form of R&D, that it's very necessary research and development. But I don't want art to be seen as like a panacea to all different kinds of problems. And I think that there are issues sometimes when artists approach really complex problems without enough domain knowledge or are making assumptions about a prob about problems on a universal scale as opposed to understanding like the locality of those problems. And like when those problems are situated in different cities or different countries, like how those problems shift and change. So this is more to say that like, when I approach problem solving, I really try to immerse myself in, in research first and in a domain to try to understand like every small, like, like all the different small like pebbles and corners and stones within it. And then try to zoom out and also look at it on a much bigger scale. Um, so for me, because I've done so much space inside of human rights, particularly online gender-based violence, usually working with journalists and activists um, outside of the, the minority world, the global north. I think a lot about how like US policy gets misconstrued inside of like the terms of service of major platforms and the kinds of problems that has when we have a very, very specific kind of narrow view as to what harm looks like and the reality of harm. So I see this a lot with like students I teach um, like across the UK and in North America is that like when you talk about let's say censorship and like state level threats that's not that's not something that like 
sometimes those students have a grounding in, but like when we're designing systems like Twitter, let's say, you have to think about that kind of use case. And it's not an edge case, right? It's a use case. This is where I, I think the work of design from the margins is incredibly important of like, when we start to center like human rights cases in a data and design process, we create safer systems. So the reason I am giving that background is like, I think it's incredibly important to have art inside of research and activism projects. The reason I approach it this way is I do really think about when I show an artwork, am I somehow flattening or contributing to like a misunderstanding that I wasn't aware of? I will say not everyone has to do my process because it is long um, and it's particular, but it, it's the one I've taken. And I think a lot of that's just because I've spent so long working in human rights, I can't turn that part of my brain off. So I look at art in a very different way now and I kind of can't, I don't know how to go back from that. I think to, to the question you asked, which I think is a, a fantastic question and I wish more people that work with data and research ask this question, which is how to work with artists. Um, I think in any way you can make space to work with artists, I think I think that's fantastic. If you're asking like a practical way to get started, if you are working a lot with data, you could perhaps start by saying, well, we need a data art artist or like a data visualizer. And then that's a good way to start the process and to start building a structure of how to work with like, let's say like more creative folks, right? Um, I I think like if you were then also sort of asking for advice based on this process, I would say it could be really helpful to think about how how will you share the research and make that creative, let's say even like a temporary expert in the domain you're working in. Um, and I, this is something where this is like a big part of if you have a, a research or an investigative based practice like a data visualizer that you have to do, you have to understand like, what the nuances are of a data set. But um, yeah, I would say, I think it's amazing that you wanna work with artists and a practical way to get started could be trying to bring in a data visualizer, but saying like, we wanna make an exhibition or a mural outside of our, um, you know, outside of our lab or something that like other people outside the school can engage with. Um, sometimes the way people sell that in a grant is to say that it's, at outreach or advocacy or um, like education. And then that can be a good way to like Trojan horse the art into the process. Not that I've, not that I've done that personally, or maybe I have, who am I to say? Who am I to say what I put in my grants? Do we have any other questions? Okay, um, any other questions? Otherwise we have more questions. <laughs> Are there any questions on Zoom? All right. Not to monopolize, if there's anyone else who wants to speak, I'll, I'll wait. Uh, so. All right. <laughs> it's on. Hi. Um, so you mentioned the um, sort of the one size fits all approach versus like or like individualized. I was wondering if you had thoughts on like accessibility on design and design, especially for like um, a deaf and hard, hard of hearing folks and like, um, yeah, that sort of thing. Um, Cause it's an issue I, I think a lot about in my like design and technology experience. So I was wondering if you've worked on any projects and have um, that like center those experiences as opposed to it's typically it's, it's often like tacked on to the end of a project rather than being the centerpiece so yeah yeah thank you so much for asking that and um, I think that's a really important question I personally because I don't often work on like let's say um I don't I don't usually work on like product product design anymore um but that is something that I recommend people think about from the very beginning it's something I ask my students of like how how is this going to be accessible like how have you thought about like screen readers for example or like audio cues or have you considered that in your code um so i think that that is and that's something when i was working with clients like a big thing we would talk about um in terms of like how to design with like disability and accessibility in mind um 
I have some like guides that I like to use. Like I follow ATNF's guide, for example. Um, I think I think it's called like the W3C. I follow those as well. Um, I'm personally very lucky that a good friend of mine is Liz Jackson, who runs the disabled list. So like I have them as a resource at at my fingertips, which I'm very spoiled to have that. Um, but it is something I I try to think about in terms of like my own personal practice, in terms of how I I like engage with disability. Um, it's something I think about as someone with like long COVID and now exhaustion and joint pain that I didn't have before, which is why I'm sitting in a chair right now, um, as opposed to standing, because I can't stand for like 40 minutes at a time. Um, but I I I was trying to think of the right way to say it. So like there are certain topics that like while I'm interested in them, they're not things I talk about publicly or I would take a research project on. So if someone approached me and said, Caroline, do you want to work on this really big project about like inclusive design or disability and design? I would say like, thank you so much for thinking of me. Um, I can recommend a variety of designers who have like a much higher expertise in that level than I do, even though it's something I think about. Um, and I think that that's, again, very much sort of a part of my practice. If it's like, if I don't think I have enough knowledge to like take on something, I don't want to take up the space of it. So like, for example, when COVID-19 started, which we're still in, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like we are, <laughs> um, like people were asking about like uh, COVID tracking and like the security and privacy issues. And um, I like declined to be on panels or be quoted on specific articles because I'm like, I don't, I don't work with, like, I don't work on medical devices and I don't know enough about like pandemics or virology to understand like what the issues are. Like I could try to threat model a little bit with you, but you're not going to get any great like policy or advocacy like thoughts out of me because it's not an area I work in. And I think it's irresponsible for me to like speak publicly on something that I don't know enough about. That's something that I wouldn't like, that something I wouldn't write a paper on. Does that make sense? So I really appreciate the question on disability. I'm trying to like sort of hedge my answers a little bit just because while it's something I've looked at and studied and I think about my practice, I don't consider myself an expert on it. Um, and so I wouldn't want to say something that like was, um, like the disability dongle, as Liz calls it, where it's like a solution, but it's not really a solution at all. Hi, sorry, I missed the beginning. I was actually in information ethics and I left just to come here. Oh, thank you. Um, and we were actually just talking about um, feminist data, fem the feminist manifesto um, and participatory design. And so I guess my question is on participatory design, how I I'm I'm, did kind of miss some of your That's talks. Okay. So like, what has been your experience with it, like doing it realistically? What are the difficulties? How have you been able to um, just make sure that you are reflecting the community um, needs while working with them? Yeah. Um, thank you so much for that. I think there are lots of issues with participatory design um, in the sense that it can be really extractive. And that's something I definitely grapple with with feminist data sets. So um, feminist data sets like a decentralized community. So uh, we often go to like physical spaces like libraries or like community art centers or museums. And that's where we'll hold like multi-day or multi-week workshops. Um, for me, those institutions have to like evidence that they have a community and that they have community ties and that 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 the workshop is something that actually interests the people that go to their events so like I don't ever want to like helicopter into a situation or be a form of like ethics washing for a museum so I often have like a lot of conversations with them around like what is their community like like can you sort of show me like interest from the community like what are previous programming things you've done that you feel like align or are related to this or like is reflective of a need um and then in the workshops themselves, the activities are are pretty much driven by the like interaction of of the group. So we only tend to like we go in a direction that's like very much sort of driven by the participants, and that sort of guides all the like like sequential activities that we'll do. Um, 
I still think that there are are issues with feminist data set, for example, um, like we do make the workshops free, but I wish that there were stipends. Oftentimes, um, like I'm sort of then at the behest of the institution based on like the size of the grant that they have or haven't written, for example. Um, some of the other issues are, and this is something I think about a lot because I'm deeply inspired by like feminist STS studies, uh, like data feminism, like feminist manifest, no, like a variety of other methodologies, but I'm also a creator and maker. And so I'm interested also in like the reality of like a toolkit or a framework and where it goes wrong. And so like, I'm a queer cis white woman, like running this project. And so we do have a lot of like, um, we do have a lot of data or text from like white creators. And so now there's a rule that you can't submit any data by white creators unless it's like very specific to like the city or like the region we're in. Like if someone wanted to submit something about like Ann Arbor um, and there was like a very particular reason then like they could submit that. But even with like these best practices that I've tried to instill, like the project's still a reflection of the reality that we live in, which is like white people are just published more even in like, even in all their contexts, right? And so like that also then becomes related to like the tools of how we use to search for data, right? Like what pops up more on Google? What's easier to find on JSTOR? What do you find out of a local library or a local archive? And so like, those are the things that are still like the basis of like the research methods because that's how we like find and surface information in our everyday lives. And so that's why I say like feminist data set is both like about failure and friction. I think of it as like a hope and a dare which is like the reason it's a failure, which I'm fine with it being that way, I'm not afraid of that word, is like, because we, because we live under like white supremacy, right? And so like the project will always be somewhat a reflection of that, of even again with like the best practices, like there's only so much available data. And so I'm trying to like create a framework and also sort of point at like, well, this is still where stuff went wrong, right? It's so like another, meta level of the project that will get pointed out is like how does arts like research get funded it, it doesn't right so like this project since 2017 has really only made technically like fourteen thousand dollars and so like that's like not a lot of money across what almost like seven years of a project right um and so like I think that's reflective of how do we think about how like art practices get funded, how like research for art gets funded, and then like what is considered like research, like what's considered like proper research that does then receive research grants. Like I've, and I've tried writing art grants for this, I've tried writing research grants for it, and it's kind of like unfundable on both sides, which I think is also then a very interesting sort of reflection of like another system that we're in, which is like how projects get funded and shepherd and maintain and publish. Maybe just one quick thing and then we should let Caroline get a drink of water, but I'm sure she'll answer more questions after. Yeah, this is super quick. I'm just letting you know that I probably will email you because Please I do. am doing my own participatory design project from mastery course. And so I just wanted to get more um, feedback and just someone who's more experienced with it. Yeah. Please, please email me. All right, and um, thank you all for coming. And also thank you to the people on Zoom. Um, we have a lot of really great events in Escape all semester. So please um, keep an eye out for, um, you know, serious things and silly things. And um, uh, we would love to see you there. Thank you so much, Caroline.